I'm pleased to welcome you to today's Faculty of Law webinar. My name is Tyler Wenzel, and I am an alumnus of the Faculty of Law, as well as a current graduate student and a nonfiction author. And I will be acting as today's question and answer moderator. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the land on which the university operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Today, I am delighted to welcome three of my fellow, T fellow U of T alumni to share this passion for writing and insights on getting published. First, we have Natalie Jenner. She is the author of two books, the instant international bestseller, The Jane Austen Society, and the forthcoming Bloomsbury Girls. The G Jane Austen Society was a USA Today, Globe and Mail, and number one national bestseller, and has been sold for translation in 20 countries. Bloomsbury Girls releases in North America on May 17th, 2022, and is also sold for translation in several different countries worldwide. So mark your calendars. Second, we have Andrew Piper. He is the author of Lost Girls, a national bestseller in Canada that won the Arthur Ellis Award for Best First Novel in 1999. His most recent novels include The Homecoming in 2019, The Only Child in 2017, and The Damned in 2015. His 2013 novel, The Demonologist, won the International Thriller Writers Award for Best Hardcover, Hardcover Novel and was a bestseller in both Canada and in Brazil. Third, we have Danny Asif, a globally recognized lawyer specializing in competition and foreign investment law and policy. He has worked on some of the largest and most complex global and Canadian mergers investigations over the last 25 years. He is the author of the memoir, Say Please and Thank You and Stand in Line, One Man's Story of What Makes Canada Special and How to Keep It That Way. Uh, questions can be asked throughout. I'll, uh, I'll accept them in the Q&A function uh, and pose them to the panelists as we go. And we'll also have some special time set aside at the end for questions. Thank you, Natalie, Andrew, and Danny. We look forward to hearing your talks today. So we'll start off with Andrew for some introductory remarks on the experience of writing. Sure, thanks everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks for being here. I, uh, I've been chosen to kick things off because I've been in this racket the longest, uh, the racket of, of, of publishing that is. And, um, and so I, I thought I'd just sort of make a quick remark about how I started, or that is to say, how I kind of made the transition from what would have been a path of conventional legal practice of one kind or another to being a full-time writer. And I was a part of the U of T class of 1995. And I was uh, sort of going back and forth between where I was living at that time and in Peterborough, where I moved because it was cheaper there than Toronto. And I was you know, doing my bar ads as I was dictating part of what would become my first novel on the commute between Peterborough and, uh, and Osgood Hall. And that turned out to be Lost Girls, my first published novel. But um, for me, that, that kind of shift from you know, lawyering, or at least the, the, in my case, the potential for lawyering and um, you know, pursuing a full-time literary career wasn't really so much a decision. I mean, it, it wasn't so much, I, you know, one day I thought I'm gonna become an author. It was, it was far more the accommodation of a compulsion. You know, it was something that I really always wanted to do. And then increasingly, as I was coming up against the reality of, oh, here's this other life, this lawyering life, this is very real now. I kind of ran the other way. So it might seem like an act of courage to pursue this dream when in fact, if anything, it was an act of, of, of sort of compulsion and, and necessity. But I'm curious to know what, what it was like for the rest of you. Oh, I wanted to be a writer from the time I was three, but I, I did not have your stupid bravery. So I decided I would go to law school as a I guess as a backup, but I was genuinely interested in the law and I did English literature, Andrew, I think you did Eng English yep. as well. Yeah, I did English literature at U of T for three years, went straight to law school and got onto that kind of King and Bay track. I was a corporate M&A securities lawyer in a tech boom and I was turning 30 and I was like, I'm going to quit it all and write that novel because I was not happy in the practice of law, though there were so many parts of it I loved. Um, so then I spent a long time trying to get published to no avail and uh, it was 
like you said, it was very much a compulsion. I, I, as I wrote more and more and I could feel myself getting better, but also making an assumption that once you write a book, you can get published. I was very naive. This is back in the nineties, literally before much home internet. And I think I thought, oh, I've written my book. Now I get published. And then I encountered that great wall <laughs> of silence because it is an industry of entertainment. And I kept writing because I had so much fun. And then one day the rejection for me um, took away the fun. And after you know decades of trying to get published, I took a big long break. So being published now late in life in my fifties has been very serendipitous and, and a lot of a surprise, but I think compulsion is the perfect word for it. You do it because you love it. And you wake up every day and you want to do it. And it just feels, this is what you want to do. And I, I love that about it. What about you, Danny? Yeah. So I kind of got here completely accidentally, but there is, a, that I can kind of tie together some of my experiences coming out of law school with, I think some of your experiences in this way is, uh, well, firstly, I'm a failed hockey player who became a lawyer. I grew up in Alberta and I'm still trying to think, you know, maybe there's a shot for me somewhere. But then this legal, this legal career and this legal education was an incredible um, experience, I think, for all of us. You know, we go to law school for different reasons. It doesn't have to be to practice. But we go to law school, I think, because we're curious and interested about our world and what makes our world tick and what makes what's important to us. And, you know, that, that idea that um, words shape our society. They words shape our society. Obviously, in law, they do, but obviously the storytelling component and the power of words. And for me, that has always been what's most interesting, even as a competition lawyer. It's what does this all mean? What is it all about? It's about how we organize our economy, how we organize our, our, our society socially, and storytelling is a big part of that. So even though I was in business school, for some reason, I got off tangent and studied classic English literature and always the power of experiencing vicariously through a story or through somebody else's words or different experiences was always valuable. It's kind of like precedent. We read a precedent to know and to guide us on how to solve a problem. And that's the same thing with stories. If we read about the stories of one another, we can experience things. We don't have direct opportunity to experience, which prepare us for future scenarios that we will find ourselves in, in one way or another, and also to help shape the world around us, just like laws do. And Andrew, we're both fiction writers. I find that I am I have a vision of how I think people should behave, how I want them to behave. So when I'm writing, I'm using story almost as a form of both control, <laughs> controlling the world, like the puppet master, but also um, for me, literary therapy, which I think with nonfiction, it's not as easy to access. But when you write fiction, like Andrew and I do, I find that I, I'm learning about myself in a really easy, fun way. I have no idea. Sometimes until after the story is done that I've also um, learned, uh, become more self-aware. There's a great quote, I think by Joan Didion. She says, I write because I am not self-aware. And I find that fiction, telling a story actually helps you learn about yourself as well as about the world outside you. I, yes, I couldn't agree more. You know, it's, it's, and that's, that, that realization has come to me quite late in the game that, it, you know, after you know, maybe like six or seven or eight novels <laughs> yeah. uh, in 25 years, you know, that, that people close to me, you know, sometimes very close to me would point out, oh, you know, here's another book where you're working out this issue. And I'm like, what? I'm completely oblivious to this, you know? Um, <laughs> Or even the even sort of down to the nitty gritty sort of weirdly subconscious details of naming characters or places that mm -hmm. it could have been anything that you conjured, but it's this particular name or a phonetic, uh, you know, sort of sound to a name or a place that someone will rightly a reader sometimes will point out. Oh, this is that in you know as it relates to your life. Again, I'm completely unaware of it. So, yeah. for me, in a deeply kind of Protestant way, this is like. You know, very. Uh, I was going to say cheap therapy. Maybe it's the most expensive form of therapy imaginable. <laughs> but, um, it's a, it certainly has like a deeply therapeutic aspect for sure. Well, just to pick up on some of the you know the things that I've experienced now. Just you know, again, I've written you know academically and and and, and, and in different ways and a textbook, but to write a book about a, a memoir and really a, a story of Canada through a unique lens or a different lens, but really 
It's our story, a Canadian story. Uh, the drawing back on experience as a lawyer and where they kind of come together. And after you publish a book, as, as you know, both of you know better than I do, you become a spectator. Like you're taking in the information. What did people get out of it? What is important to them? What is relevant in the story that I told? And one of the most interesting things that I've heard back to me, which was fascinating, is from people across the political spectrum, firstly, interesting, in an age where we think there's no consensus, <laughs> and across so people of every background saying to me, thank you for being my voice. And I'm like, firstly, I don't even really know what my own voice is, firstly. And it's interesting to hear that kind of that response to me, thank you for being my voice. And I think that's something that for me, I wasn't expecting and is a beautiful aspect about writing something that resonates with people is like an advocate, like you, like I, in my practice, people come to you for a voice to tell their side of the story. And it's kind of the same in our society that you can be the voice of others and help bring things that are important to others to light or to highlight, you know, to, to prominence in, in, in some hopefully kind of maybe potentially <laughs> uh, meaningful way. I, um, I wrote my book, The Jane Austen Society, a year and a half before the pandemic. Um, yeah, and in fact, when I sold it, um, I have a, a New York publisher, I don't have a Canadian publisher. When I sold it, it was around Christmas of 2018. So the industry has, a, it's a year and a half behind itself when you have a, a fiction title coming out in the States and nobody knew that this terrible time was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And I had written my book coming out of a personally challenging time involving my husband's health. And I wrote the book for myself and for him. The book is dedicated to him. What was really fascinating for me as a human being and a great privilege um, was providing um, a vehicle of entertainment Mm -hmm. um, that people write to me all the time and say, this is exactly what I needed during the pandemic. You know, this gave mm -hmm. me hope. I mean, like you said, Danny, it's like one of the great privileges of having a forum um, and sharing, you know, a talent and a skill, like Andrew said, in this compulsive way that, you know, we, we get benefit and then we see other people get benefit from it. And that's that reader, actor, sorry, reader, author kind of engagement that and in fact, Andrew, what's fascinating for me as like a fiction writer is thinking about how I want to treat the, the information I convey and when I want to give it to the reader. And what Danny was talking about at the beginning about language and how, you know, when we tell a story um, using, you know, clear language and effective language, um, my biggest lesson that I would share with everybody who's watching who has a, a novel in them, let's say, and, and, are, and are curious is my biggest lesson was to think more about my audience Mm -hmm. which is strange given everything I've just said about how it's literary therapy and I was working through you know a difficult time in life but what I learn as I write more and I'm you know only have one book published and Andrew has like 27 <laughs> I mean, don't, you have a lot um, but, but the more I write the more I become conscious of of the audience's needs and I think for anyone that's interested in fiction and then I'll bounce it over to you Andrew as, another, as a fellow fiction writer but for anyone that's interested in fiction I think we um we fall in love with our little darlings. We're, we're, all, we're, we're, we're all very lucky to be this educated. Um, we have a way with words. We've loved literature and language for a long time. And I think what I've had to like kind of let go of is there's lots of good writers out there, but are you telling a story that keeps people engaged from A to Z? And that is sort of like the, I think the kind of ground zero. What about you, Andrew? Do you find that that's yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and I think for me, one of the ways that you can um, uh, you know, tackle that issue, you know, audience, market, these sort of things that we're supposed to, as authors, be kind of, you know, allergic to thinking about. Um, but I think you can do it in a way that's not kind of, you know, not necessarily kind of crude yeah. and require some kind of marketing, you know, MBA or something. You can do it through, and what I like to do is through outlining the story yeah. so that Again, you know, sort of if there's people, you know, watching us now and you're sort of thinking, I've got an idea for a book or I've got an idea for a novel. And that's probably true of, you know, everyone. Um, 
is to sort of before you sort of like, you know, I'm just going to start typing this thing before you start to because, you know, the, the presumption is, isn't that what writing is? Writing is just sort of, you know, a, a monkey kind of slapping away at a keyboard and you produce words. And when you get a, a sufficient number of words, you have a book. It may not be good, but you have a book. And I, I kind of try to uh, push back against that presumption and encourage people to think about the story in advance and to outline it, not necessarily in a way of like creating a synopsis, but to, you know, kind of just sort of quiz and interrogate and question who's this story, who's driving the story? Who is the I, if there is an I? Mm -hmm. um, what is the story saying? Again, I don't mean thematically, but just sort of, is it about, this is about a guy who gets lost in the woods and survives. You know, something really, that kind of, that kind of, um, you know, a, a capsule. And that can be extremely difficult to, you know, you sort of think that, come on, like I, that's the easiest part, right? And it's like, no, finding what your story is about is extremely difficult. And it's why I think a lot of books that are started without that thinking being done beforehand, that's where manuscripts get finished halfway or whether you just sort of throw it against the wall or you walk away for it, or you realize I'm not a writer. I think, I think it's simply not that you're not a good writer in some technical sense, it's that you haven't adequately sort of nurtured and, 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 and sort of felt and expanded and, and, and um, you know, kind of weighed this idea before embarking on it. So that would be my one, you know, if I had one nugget of possibly useful insight into how to approach this, it would be that. I think Natalie and Andrew, you guys, this is, this is a powerful um, a part aspect of our conversation is, you know, this idea of uh, no, it's really knowing your audience. I mean, you're bringing your own passion and, and skills to write, but knowing your audience. And I think what happens are a couple of things. Firstly, again, to relate it to, you know, this common law school education and, and what it teaches you. It teaches you to survey, to, to observe, to take in facts, to take in information in any scenario. I mean, that's what we're trained to do. You can come in a boardroom, a courtroom, the street, a client meeting, doesn't matter. You're equipped to sit down and listen and analyze and assess and prioritize. And then to try, if we can, I mean, God forgive me for many of the, most of the time I fail maybe, thinking of what's relevant to these people in this context. What is it that I know? What is it that I have seen? What is it that I have learned that will help these folks in this situation or be of value. And I think when we sit down to write, you are subconsciously, you know, you've read, you've observed, you've seen. Not only you were talking about pre-pandemic, but you were, you were, you're soaking in what's around you. And then as you write, and that gets to Andrew's point, what's the point of this story? It's not just for me to put words on a paper like a monkey on a keyboard. How do I bring what I know and what I see to paper to try to benefit others? And that, there's nothing more rewarding than that. And it's amazing how much that legal education and that training prepare, can prepare you for that if this is a passion within you or something that you want to explore. I always tell people that I actually think if I had to choose, I always read classics and great yeah. works of genius. Um, between my legal education and my undergrad, for me, after a day of reading Virginia Woolf for Henry James, you just go home. And, I don't know about you, Andrew. I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> like, these people are so brilliant. When I was at law school, what I learned besides perseverance, like there's nothing like going into an exam when you're like 200 pages behind in the readings and just going, it's gonna, it's gonna hit it. Um, I learned though also to, and I think it serves me well in all aspects of life. My legal education taught me to look at things from more possible angles than most people I know. And I think that that ability to look at something from every different angle as a writer, helps me decide as I'm going through the story, what, um, is this really, re is this really relevant? Like you said, Danny, right? Is this the most relevant thing at this moment? And Andrew, one of the things I do as I write, I think I'm constantly going, is this the time to hint at? 
X. Like I treat, I don't write thrillers like Andrew. Um, I write historical fiction, but they say you should treat every story as a mystery. And, you know, and Jane Austen, when she wrote Emma, like Emma's considered to be like the first detective novel. I mean, she's holding back clues and she's making the reader work to figure out what's going on. And I think the, the last thing I would say about in terms of my legal education, teaching me sort of that precision of language and, mm -hmm. and what is the right word at that moment that's going to convey tone or character, atmosphere or plot. But, but the other thing that I think it, it taught me is to, um, <laughs> right now to the contrary is to be as efficient um, as well as effective as possible with language um, to convey an idea that everyone will understand and that is something that I try very hard as a writer to to make sure I'm doing and not to obfuscate or make it um, too difficult for the reader to figure out there's a balance there between getting the mystery going and having them feel like they've earned, the reader has to feel like they've earned everything that's about to happen, the payoff. So that, you, you just reminded me of something kind of actually humorous to me and about the classics. So Shakespeare told us, brevity is the soul of wit, yeah. but he had one of those long-winded characters utter those words. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, how it's storytelling is, is, is really, really powerful. And you could learn so much from those classics, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, I would, yeah, I would, you know, I agree. And, and Natalie, you're sort of talking about, uh, you know, sort of legal skills that become relevant in, you know, in, in this in this business. And one of them is actually kind of interestingly only kind of to me anyway, is kind of become relevant in relatively recent times. And that is pitching, you know, oh. pitching has become when I first started publishing, you know, you went away, you wrote a manuscript, you sent it if you know, you, you acquired an agent. If you had an agent, you send it to the agent and she would go out and try to sell it. And you were, throughout the writer was, you know, aside from maybe a phone call with a with an editor, you were just, you stayed in your room and you were, you know, you were silent outside of the text. And now we're living in, I think in the age, whether you're a writer or not, we're living in the age of the pitch. You know, you pitch to your to your boss to sort of start an initiative. You, you pitch, uh, in this case, you know, I, I constantly am being asked to pitch ideas to whether it's my own reps or to potential buyers or as the business becomes increasingly kind of intermingled with different media i.e television film podcasts you're being at the author is being called upon to demonstrate skills that that we never used to be you know asked to 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 use that is you know sort of quickly you know in five minutes assemble your thoughts answer these questions as though you, you've anticipated them. And so all of that, you know, takes me back to law school where you're being asked to constantly kind of, you know, attempt the theater of intelligence and, and <laughs> organize thoughts and, uh, you know, stuff that I haven't been, you know, haven't, I haven't had to do on my feet for, you know, since moot court. Right, those moots yeah. have more value than you'd imagine. <laughs> It's actually, um, it's fascinating to me because when, when I was um, on submission with the Jane Austen Society and my agent's like, so some publishers want to talk to you on the phone. It was all very exciting. It's like, just um, make sure you know how to answer. What are you working on now? And I'm like, what am I working on now? <laughs> like, I just wrote this thing. So I had to like come up with ideas, um, some which didn't end up selling, didn't end up happening. I, I think one of the other things that I mean, you do learn, I think from law school, that perseverance, but from a legal career, I was a coach to lawyer, lawyers for about 20 some years. Um, there, there's built in weird rejection that comes at odd times because of the, the intake and the arc of the career. And you know, your career looks a certain way and then you don't make partner, right? Like everything was fine until then. So I would come in and coach people at these really difficult times. And one of the things I've learned as a writer and, and maybe Andrew, you, know, you probably have better luck at this than I, but there's, there's a lot of built-in rejection that happens. Like every day I get good news and every day I get bad news. And I'm not exaggerating. It's very up and down. And I love that I just kind of go with it. I celebrate the wins like crazy. But one of the things I think that lawyers are really good at is adapting and pivoting when they need to. Um, and I think that that also will serve you very well as that dealing with the rejection that comes. Um, and that's something that I've been really happy with the lawyers I've worked with as a coach to see that ability to go, Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna figure this out, and that that is something that will serve anyone really well who's gonna try and get a, a novel published or a or a nonfiction book like Danny. 
uh, Natalie, I just want to say for practicing lawyers, I mean, there's no better practice than the beating you get from clients yes. and opposing counsel. So yeah. that really prepares you well for any kind of rejection. You build a tough, a tough yeah. skin. And yeah. back to Moots, you guys remind me of the best advice I ever received on presentation, which again, I don't know if I, how, how well I stick to it, but I was in a mood and I made my presentation and I can't remember who the judge was. And he said to me, you know, I think your idea was kind of good. It was, I, it was pretty, it was pretty effective. He said, most importantly, your presentation was extremely effective because you abided by the golden rule. And I said, what's that rule? He said, well, a pastor friend of his said, when he gives a sermon, he talks about God and he talks about 10 minutes. And he said, you talked about 10 minutes. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> and I've never forgot those words. Great advice from moot court, whatever it was. Thank you, U of T, again, for the many gifts and for that one nugget of beautiful life advice. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. Yes, that, that, that sort of um, um, uh, you know, brevity and the concision of, of, of expressing an idea. Again, it's sort of like, you th you one assumes that that's just useful in uh, you know presenting an idea or trying to sell mm -hmm. an idea, but I think you need to do that that process in order to write the idea. Yeah. Again, I think I think you know bef it's before one gets kind of too deep into writing a a, a, a long work of fiction or nonfiction. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the thinking, the pre writing, the the thinking that you do brought prior to embarking on it is so crucial, and it's the thing that I think people kind of in their uh, excitement to get started on a project, tend to leapfrog over, and then you're in trouble. Um, and speaking of trouble, you know, to your point, Natalie, about rejection. Yeah, I mean, I was asked recently to give a, a an address to a group of of like a writers society, and I decided for my topic to be about failure. Uh, I spoke for an hour about failure because failure is obviously we all experience failure, but I don't. There's very few professions I can think of that where failure is just, I mean, just a voluminous yeah. <laughs> uh, tsunami of failure is built in like writing. Part of the job and, description, right? Oh, it's, it's, you know, and there is no level, there is no level of, of success That's at right. which you're immune to it. You know, it oh, just is constant. Yeah. So I think it's a really, uh, well, humbling, obviously, but yeah. it, it, I think it's a, it provides a life lesson of how to not just endure failure. It's not just a matter of like, the world is full of idiots and they just yeah. don't understand me. It's not about that. It's about, you know what, there's always something in rejection that is useful. You know, it, it could be like, oh, the reason you're not responding is correct. Or no, I don't think the reason you're giving me that you're not responding is mm -hmm. correct, but there's something behind the note. There's, yeah. if I sort of turn what you're saying, I see something useful there. So that you, I think that reflex, that human reflex of being defensive, like you're wrong. Yes. Why don't you, you yes. should all love it. And if you don't love it, you're wrong. Yes. You, I think you have to learn to get past that or else Absolutely. you're never going to grow. I, I, that, that could not be more right. And I remember thinking when I was first, I mean, I've written, I'm on my ninth novel, one published um, and another one coming, coming up in the rear. But um, when I was writing the first five or six books and sending them out, I remember thinking it just had to show talent and someone was going to grab me. And I think, Andrew, if we were a Venn diagram, I think you were, you probably are the slightly from this more historic time of Canadian publishing where things looked a certain way. And when where I was entering it, which was the age of, I think, you know, the internet and, and social media. So around 2006-ish, um, what happened for me was I thought I just had to show talent. But what I didn't realize, and my biggest advice to everyone is um, make it the best book you can make it. And that goes back to what Andrew said about taking the time to plan. So I am Gabby. I was a coach for a living. And then I had a quiet year with um, my husband's situation. And I read a lot of Jane Austen. And what ended up happening was I unintentionally immersed myself and saturated myself in the writing of Jane Austen and the writing about her. That led eventually to that creative spark, that moment of inspiration. And I was ready for it. And my kid sister loves to say, maybe you just need to shut up for a year to write your book. But I think that I, I think I kind of did. I think I kind of needed to have some quiet time and immerse myself in something that I was passionate about, which is Jane Austen and her writing. And that I think created an authentic, organic experience for me. Um, and then when I sat down to write, I knew the stakes. 
and I think this is the other piece of advice I would get is whether you outline like some of my colleagues outline chapter by chapter before they start. I know people who write the ending before they start. If I had to, if I had to write the ending, I wouldn't write the book. I write to get to the end. It's mm -hmm. this wonderful feeling of exhilaration. But the last thing I would say and share is that I feel that um, there's no one way to do it. But for me, I need to know three things where it's taking place so I can visualize settings. Setting is very important in historical fiction, my books. When it's taking place also goes to character. Um, what kind of people are people people in this world of historical fiction? And thirdly, what's at stake? What is the thing that everybody wants? Um, often it's a consensual need. Sometimes it's individual needs, but one thing um, is ultimately at stake. And once I know kind of what everyone sort of wants, then I allow myself, um, but only after I've done a lot of research and immerse myself in a lot of the themes and, and aspects of what I'm gonna write about. And I think it is really important to have that sort of saturation or immersion period that Andrew was, I think, talking about in a way. Yeah, I would add, quickly add, uh, or as quickly as I can, one other thing that's a kind of a, an addendum to what you just said, Natalie, and about you know what, what are the tools you need before starting? And this is, I think, mostly relevant to a novel, but um, I gave a reading once and, and uh, at which there was uh, an audience of one person who showed up and uh, which <laughs> yeah, is not is, unusual. Yeah, this is rejection. This happens all the time. <laughs> all, all happens, yeah, yeah, one is great. And, uh, <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but she said in, in the Q&A afterwards where she was the only Q, uh, <laughs> she offered this, this comment uh, more than a question, which was, she said that, you know, write, reading your books, and I think this is true of all books, by the way, not just mine, is like driving a car at night and you have the high beams on and you're on this curving forest road, you know, where you're trying to trying to see around the next corner where you get, you have a sense that there's something there you're trying to catch up to. And sometimes you even see a glimpse of brake lights of this car ahead that you're pursuing, but now you're going too fast. You're trying to catch up and you feel the car begin to skid. And just before you fly off the road, you hear a, a pounding coming from inside your car and you pull over and it's the last thing you want to do, but you get out of the car and you go around to the back and you pop the trunk and you look inside and it's you in there. And she sat down and I thought that's the weirdest comment I've ever heard, you know what? <laughs> but upon reflection, I, I think that's a tremendously useful um, insight into your main character in the, in the case of fiction. That is to say, you need to know what she wants, where she thinks she's going, what she thinks she needs to find out in that car ahead that she's you know sort of driving fast toward. But you also need to know what it, she is oblivious to, what's in the trunk. What does your character not know about herself at the outset that she will come to see revealed about herself through the course of the story? So, so that, that's not true. You don't need that necessarily about every character, but I think a main character, you need to know, again, what she's driving toward and what she can sort of not escape that's in the car with her. I'm gonna have to. That is, again, I said, well, firstly, I think the, the, the description that she gave is an incredible compliment yeah. Yeah. to you, Andrew, uh, and it, it shows the power of your storytelling is ultimately, you know, when you tell a story that reveals something that teaches you about yourself. Because again, you know, like many things, like life is about growth, right? It's a journey about growth, whatever, whatever you do, whether you eat, whether we, when we eat, when we travel, it's about growing something and experience, going to see something. And, and when you write, you want people to grow from it. To say, and this is one of the things, again, as an observer, you sit back and there's nothing nicer than when somebody says, I learned something about myself from your story. It opened my mind to something that wasn't, uh, that hadn't revealed itself and made me think about how I'm going to do things tomorrow. And that is for all of us, what we see, whether it's in law school, legal career, is we want our society to progress. And to try, if we can, in very modest ways, to push it, in there, whatever we touch, whatever we choose to touch, to push it, push it towards progress. And I think that comes back to why we, why we go to law school, why we, why we write, why we want to write, 
and why storytelling is remains, even in the age of the internet, even in the age of all this entertainment on demand and everything and the complexity of the world and the issues that we see, the stories we tell one another and the narrative that we outline for what our society is, are still the most powerful and most important aspects of our lives. And we can see that today. We don't have to talk about politics, but we see, you know, just in a nonpartisan way, you know, with, you know, the politics in the South or here or wherever, you know, I'm always struck by, again, the, the election of, of, of a person in the midst of all of this complexity and the issues and the gravity, four words, make America great again with a red hat, convince tens of millions of people in that narrative that that will make your life better. Absolutely still fascinating how that can happen in any age, any time, regardless of what we think of technological progress and the power of stories. And Andrew, you didn't practice, but um, you, right? You didn't practice law, but you articled and yeah. all that. Do, do you, for me, I didn't practice towards law, but the classes that stay with me and the decisions that stay with me in my brain, 30, it's 30 years now, plus I think 31 years since I first showed up at law school, um, were sort of like those crazy judgments by like Laura Denning or like these, these torts and negligence cases, you know, where it's bluebell time in Ken, or there's like a cricket game going on. And you know, it's like, and they were all really stories. They were, they were getting people at the outset with the preamble to care about what was at stake and to picture what was at stake in this like really colorful way. way. And it, as from a legal educational standpoint, I remember the certain decisions more because of what was at stake, but also the way in which the information was presented. And, and I don't think that legal judgment or judicial you know, decision writing um, necessarily helps you write a novel. But I do think that there's a lot of lawyers who've become writers. And I do think there's something about, Danny said this earlier, understanding the power of the word and understanding the power of story. And I think what litigators especially um, often come up against is persuading a, a group of people, a captive audience um, through storytelling um, that there is one way to look at the situation. And I think from a macro standpoint, that is sort of what the author's job is too. And uh, I, do, I do feel, I mean, I was, I was looking this up because I didn't know my favorite poet is Wallace Stevens. And I actually thought he'd been an insurance man, but he actually had been a lawyer. And that Harper Lee, who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, um, was the daughter of a lawyer. Her sister's the lawyer, was a lawyer, and, and she was also a lawyer shortly, um, as well as, you know, a lot of current writers. And not just legal thrillers, a lot of historical fiction writers like me um, have a background in legal education. I don't think it's coincidental. Um, and I'm, again, like Danny was saying, really grateful that I, that I got the education that I did. No, on that point, yeah, it's it's true, right? I mean, that what writers do or must do is kind of um, we we we've already talked about the, you know the summoning of details, the sort yeah. of the Danny you were talking about, you know, being observant of the world, and, and and that's certainly true. And then from that though, what what must follow from that is the discernment between those details. That 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 for the purposes of your given narrative, they can't all be equal. Uh, you know, that the, the way someone walks cannot possibly be equal to you know, why someone decides to, you know, sort of leave their family um, within the context of a story. So um, it's that discernment of detail and argument, uh, prioritizing what, what must go in, into this. That's the litigator's job, I think, right? In a nutshell, it's, look, it's not just a matter of like, I have eight points, they're all the same. You could, I could start with seven or I could start with one. You know, it has to be one. And if you don't buy this, how about two, three, four, right? It's like, <laughs> In the alternative, um, so yeah, a, a lot of that kind of organizational, like what's my ace? What what kind of hand do I have here? And how do I best arrange these details slash cards uh, to sort of make the most persuasive hand? Like that, I think that is, you know, that the writer's kinship with the litigator is closest there. You're absolutely right. It's, it, is, it is this unique ability to take in a lot of information and many, many observations. And the richest, the best, the most powerful stories are someone who can take all of that and has observed the most 
they possibly can, and to know in a precisely what proportion to relay or incorporate that information into that story, because it will be the richest story. So something may have, you know, you can hear it in equal measure, but it has kind of a 0.1 contribution. But that 0.1 contribution will give something, another contour, or give someone, a, someone more people a hook into appreciating what you're trying to tell because you'll never know what resonates with someone and what subtlety someone will pick up that others won't. Yeah. And that is, I think, again, when you're trained as a lawyer and, and go to law school, it is, a, it, is a, it is a unique education that firstly allows you to, in a, in a, you're, in a, we're taught in an agnostic way, unemotionally, take it in. It's gonna help you. You may not like it, but it's gonna be good for you. <laughs> Take it in, park it, okay? Now, somebody needs you to do something. Think about how that may or may not be relevant and in precisely what proportions and how to prioritize that. And that is the beauty of law school. And I think what, what made us for sure love law school and its experience and its education and why it has allowed us to do, and the people on this call who have generously made their time to be with us to do the variety of things that folks with a legal education do and have done. It's absolutely, it's, it's, and I still, to my, you know, I should, with our children, many of us encourage them to go to law school. We tell them, you don't necessarily have to practice, but it is, it is still an incredible uh, education and foundation to build a life upon. It can serve you well too, I have found, or, or not well as the case may be, in familial managerial context. So, <laughs> uh, the other day, my, my kids, my daughter in particular, really hates, uh, you know, sort of if we have a conflict because she's like, Dad, you, you, yeah. you, you bring your lawyer voice. Yeah. I've never practiced. Apparently, I have a yeah. lawyer voice. Yeah. But the other day I heard myself say, and I hated, I don't know if I've ever hated myself more, but I found myself saying to her, you knew or ought to have known. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what a jerk I am. <laughs> I always joke, we make bad friends because it's hard to tell a lawyer a story. So before I went to law school, people would tell me a story. I went to the store at six o'clock and I bought a Coke and you know, it was really bright out. And then... I would stop them, I'd go six o'clock, but the sun sets at five. How did you see the sun? It's, they're like, that's not the point of the story. Let me finish. And then they're like, well, you know, I bought a Coke and a Pepsi was $8. I'm like, no, but I went to that store, it was $3.99, the thing where you buy the, they're like, stop it, stop it. <laughs> Let me tell you the fact that I got mugged. I got assaulted, I almost died. I'm here telling you that I survived this. <laughs> So there is a, there is a, there is some uh, downsides too, but anyway. yeah. fortunately we have family. They have to stick with us through thick and thin. So uh, we got that at least. <laughs> I feel so seen. I just, I, both of you, as you, I'm like, I've done both those things and I didn't really, <laughs> really connect it to being a lawyer. Um, Tyler, do we have, do I have a second to ask uh, Danny something about writing, I guess not memoir, Danny, but non-fictional account yeah. uh, you know of generations of your family your own experiences um one of my friends um who's a vietnamese um refugee um came to america very young and wrote an amazing uh, memoir called saigon and mm -hmm. he said to me that the hardest Phuc Dranh, he said to me the hardest thing with that kind of writing is knowing what to leave out so not just prioritizing but what not to put in all is that what you found so I think people say, you know, you wrote this book. I say, yeah, you know, it's, it's fascinating. And I feel like I wrote two books to get one book out because there were so many things where on reflection and with people getting that feedback, that rejection in a sense of sending it out there and being open to that criticism and saying, you know what, that's not really relevant here or it's not as compelling as you think it is. Hmm. And still bringing it back to why are we telling this story? And for me, it was, to tell a story in this time about Canada through this historic uh, migration of Muslims to Canada, which a lot of people did not know. And my great grandfather came in the twenties, they built this mosque in Edmonton. Anyway, you know, for me, it was a lived experience. So I thought every kind of like, who, you know, why would anyone care, who knows? And so many people occurred to me, we don't know this story. We don't know this history, especially in these times, tell that story. And that always motivated me. Like, I'm not, 
just telling a story about my family. I want to tell a story about us, but through this lens that will remind us and reaffirm what we have and what's important to us in this age. And that we can all again, continue to find this consensus to build the best and, and brightest chapter of our history and for our kids and for the next generation. So that was really actually hard was putting things that I thought were really interesting kind of family stories. And, so, and then people say X out, X out. And, uh, and that, again, getting beaten up, beaten up by clients and opposing counsel really helped kind of uh, pick myself up, dust myself off, and keep going. <laughs> but yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, a, a big part of what my experience, too. Well, perhaps that's a good point for me to uh, a, a little early, I know, but there's some, there's some good questions, and uh, I have some of my own, too. Um, so first off, um, Building off of what of uh, Andrew's the feedback that Andrew received about driving on the winding road and hearing the knocking from within inside the vehicle and then finding it to be yourself, uh, Danny. I wanted to uh, similar to Natalie's question. I wanted to give that to you as writing a memoir. Was there anything that you found that perhaps you were oblivious to? Yeah. Uh, you, you had the stakes of your own story. You knew the characters intimately. Was there anything that you kind of discovered at the end of your journey that really stuck out for you? You know, for me, I really discovered, you know, in this age of, of difference, everybody kind of studying difference of really how common and how this, you know, I always say, Jay, Joe, you know, we, I feel like I have a PhD in the difference, just what I've soaked in. I want to engage in the study of sameness. I want to get a PhD in rediscovering what's common, our common humanity. And, you know, this story helped me, telling this story helped me rediscover that. Because as I talked about my family through generations and that original immigrant experience and the ups and the downs and how, you know, we are all vulnerable, the vulnerability. So I always thought of myself as, you know, objectively, like we, I can persevere anything. And I don't think of myself as vulnerable. But as I told this story and I reflected on those generations who had put those roots down and were welcomed with open embrace in Canada to build a mosque in Edmonton in the 30s, in the Depression, with the help of the broader community, Christians, Jews, others, and with obviously at that time, not there weren't a lot of resources, but people gave, non-Muslims gave to build that. And then to see it come back around where we could be the other. And, and I thought, we genuinely are all vulnerable. And in a moment, the narrative can change and turn any of us into the other. And as any chain is only as strong as its weakest link, that we have to always be aware of that vulnerability because it, it keeps us humble and it allows us to empathize. And through an empathy and what I, what, I, what I discovered was really empathy is the foundation of consensus. In an age where we can't seem to find consensus, having that empathy. And that for me was the journey my book took me through was that doesn't matter what you think, we are all vulnerable. We remain one another's keeper. Mm -hmm. And that if one of us is weak, we're all worse off. And what we have is vulnerable. Our greater society is what's fascinating about empathy is they say that the more you read the more you you build empathy and find it in, very interesting when you think about how unlike most other art forms a book puts you inside someone else's mind and you are looking out through their eyes at the world and you know i love ballet and movies and things that they don't always do that and that that intimacy and that closeness of the consciousness of the character or the voice danny's voice telling the story of his generations of his family um enables us to be so close to somebody else and start to understand why they care the way they do and feel their pain and that is why i mean i'm had a bookstore i ran my own bookstore andrew did an event there actually just remembering um but very passionate about reading and and the great greatest readers in my life are the many many lawyers that are my friends and and I find that very fascinating like lawyers they love books they love to read but they love novels they love stories and I think that makes 
I think there's a responsibility in our profession as well in servicing the client and in looking at things from the client's needs that also speaks to empathy. And I, again, just feel really grateful that the two degrees I got were in English literature and law. I, I just, I, I think it, it builds that, um, that, that empathy and interest in others, that curiosity that Danny was saying at the very beginning. I think it just, I think it really feeds that. A follow-up question. This is for everyone. Um, we had within our alumni network here. We have um, busy practicing lawyers. We have people that aspire to be full-time writers, and we have people who are going through a combination of personal and professional travails. So we we have representatives of all three groups uh, here. So I'd like to pose it to you: What did you find to be best practices in terms of routine? For all of you, you've mentioned that it's very therapeutic to write. So it's something you're compelled to do. So you make time, you find time. Um, but how do you do that? How do you fit in the right amount of time when you are going through personal challenges, when you're taking care of a loved one, when you've got a busy practice and you're early on in your career or later on in your career and you're under billable pressures? And for full -time, aspiring full-time writers, when you, you have deadlines to meet and you expect rejection because that is baked into the process. I'll go first because um, it's a short answer is that I, as a, a working mom and a stay-at-home mom who coached around her daughter's school hours, I taught myself to wake up at 5 a.m. And I wrote every morning from five to about 6.45. And then I did the rest of my day. And to this day, as an empty nester, with a fully retired husband and oodles of time for the first time in my life, I still get woken by my characters on my story at 5 a.m. And the other time is nine to 11 at night. And I would say to people, find the time every day that you can commit to, and it can be just 20 minutes. It can be an hour, um, but find that time. And if you commit to it day after day, what happened was I trained my creative subconscious mind to kick in at that time. And now it usually meets me a little quicker than it might otherwise. Yeah, I would, I would add that that's good, you know, that, that uh, and it built into that response, I think, Natalie, is the, 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 the observation that we all perceive ourselves to have no time, right? I mean, I have a friend who, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, he inherited great wealth at an early age. He's never had a conventional job in his, in his life. And he, to my perception, does nothing. Uh, <laughs> but... But he will describe his days being like, I'm so busy. I have no time. I, there's no way I could, I want to write this book. I have no time. So we all perceive ourselves as being extremely taxed, but there's always something that could be carved out time-wise. Time, if you really are going to be, you know, sort of, you know, brutally self-critical about it, there's always a Netflix show that you don't need to watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's always something that you can sort of set aside. Time is a lesser challenge, I think, than using the time well. And one tip that I use to use that hour, half hour, whatever it is, use it well, is to count words. The words don't have to be great, but you could say, set really, really modest goals for yourself. I'm going to write 200 words today. If you write 200 words, five days a week, that's a thousand words in a week. You could have essentially a manuscript for a full, you know, like a, like a novel in a year and a half. So that is within, within easy reach of all of us. So it's carve out a bit of the time. The time's not that tough. It's using the time in a productive way. Okay. Both who are practicing, you know, for me, number one, my people say, how do you write that book? I say, you know, a little picking up on what Andrew and Natalie said. It's, it's a, it is, it's a hobby. It's, it's my, it's my hobby. And it's, and we were talking about this earlier, how we write and it is therapeutic. So for me, I do, I get, and, and about what Andrew said, you know, the efficient time is the most, obviously the most valuable resource. You can never replace a minute that passes by can never be replaced. So we're all so respectful of that. And if we ever forgot, we ever, if we ever forget as a practicing lawyer, somebody will tell you, you didn't get your dockets in. If you're ever wondering the value of time, you've got people who are about, your dockets are late. But I get up, you know, on a plane, I get up in the morning, it's my hobby. I take an old fashioned, old fashioned fountain pen and a piece of paper and write. And the other thing that I've learned is write a, even a horrible first draft. Just spill it out there. For me, it worked. Just put it out there, write, 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 write. Just let it kind of flow. Don't be too self-critical in the beginning and then just work it in later. You filter, you filter, you filter. 
but there's a joy in it. It's like sculpting. It's like afterwards, like you look at that, no matter what it is, it's a horrible mess of clay. But then there's the joy of actually sculpting those words and taking the time. And then it somehow becomes like a self-reinforcing positive experience instead of a chore. So it's a hobby, make time for it, consider it its therapy of how you try to think of reconcile the things around you. We're doing that anyway, every day. We're trying to make sense of our world and just do it as Mike told us, whenever that was, just do it. <laughs> right on. Uh, well, related to that, as you're going <laughs> through this process, to what extent are you sharing what you're writing with friends, loved ones, confidants, agents, etc. Do you, have you found, you know, that you, you keep it to yourself for a long period of time, or is it more of an iterative process? Do you have people in your life that you um, like to bounce things off of as you go, or is it more of a get to a key benchmark and then let it see the light of day? I want to hear Angie's answer because you've written so many books. I'm curious. Um, for you has it always been your your wife like what's been your first audience yeah she's she's among the first I, I i have come to learn i used to be very and i think the instinct is to be very private and protective of our ideas as if you know if you shared it in a you know in an elevator that person's going to run out and steal your idea and the, the the fact is that they're not i mean people are not going to steal your idea because they think that their idea is far better than yours anyway so i think the the fear of 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 you know, sort of sharing your idea is overstated, but I think pitching and sort of like verbalizing your idea as you go is enormously helpful because it points out um, so many of the things you, to yourself, you did basically you're pitching yourself. You sort of say, well, my story is about this. It's about a guy who robs a bank. Well, wait a minute. Why is he robbing a bank? Does he have to be a bank robber? And before you know it, you're kind of, you know, you're, you're giving yourself notes. It doesn't really matter what the audience to your pitch is going to offer you. That might be relevant, but more relevant is how you know, how the mistakes of the idea or how what the, the sort of the, the sort of flabby aspects to the concept sound in your own ears. Mm -hmm. And so I think verbalizing, literally pitching to a mirror uh, can be an enormously cheap and cheerful way of kind of um, interrogating an idea at an early stage. Oh, I'm wildly superstitious and I don't, I write the first draft and I give it, I'm not joking, halfway through, I give it to my husband and I'm like, yes or no, you can, you get to say one of two words, just like it's keep going, babe, or like God stop. And, and he's always said yes. And um, then when the first draft is done, I give it to my agent. We're working on our fourth book now together I give it to my agent and uh then that's a lean first draft um and I also give it to some writer friends but at the very very beginning I think Lionel Shriver just recently said this as well I do do what Andrew is talking about I pitch I try out ideas I go what about if something like this happened or what if it took place in Italy or uh, you know what if it took place here or what if a bunch of people were after x and I try out on a more macro level but once I start writing, I, I am wildly superstitious, but I'm new, I'm a newbie. So maybe that'll change with time. So I, I've had a little bit of a, a different experience. I have, uh, so I, for me, two things first in the year, one, one you've told us from family. It's not like family to give you real advice because they don't care. And they're like, that sucks. Holy man, how could you think anyone would care? <laughs> so that's a beautiful first filter, like, my wife, my kids, dad, that's dumb, which is a standard answer. So then I seek some other audiences who are maybe a little more forgiving. And I write, I write off ads. I, you know, again, like trying to share ideas or capture what's important to our Canadian conversation. And I write off ads and every once in a while, fortunately they get picked up by the newspapers and then you get feedback. And actually that was how this book started as I wrote an op-ed in 2013, because in addition to this family history, my son in 2012, 100th anniversary of the Great Cup, I'm from Edmonton. My son was one of two Canadian kids who got to take the flag to midfield. And I thought like, I really, life is unbelievable. I mean, I grew up Edmonton Eskimos, the winter football, all that stuff. And my son got to do this. And I wrote an op-ed about the times and divisiveness and how my son after all this years there and people that people said 
that should be a book. And so for me, that is a way of getting ideas out there and for getting that feedback and also trying to figure out what is important to our conversation and trying to respond to that. Right on. So there are right. a lot of ways. Wonderful. To get feedback and test things. We're just about at time, folks. So I'm going to have one more question. Um, so we know what to read by Danny. We know what to read by Natalie. And we've all marked our calendars for Bloomsbury Girls. <laughs> uh, I have an important question for Andrew because when we wade into the canon of Andrew Piper books, uh, where should we all start? What is our entry level Andrew Piper book that you would recommend for us? Hi, sorry guys, I got kicked off there. Back. Oh, back. you're back. I'm back. <laughs> Uh, did you hear the question or should I repeat uh, it? No, I'm sorry, I didn't. Okay, so uh, we know what to read by Natalie and what to look out for next. And we know what to read by Danny. However, your canon is extensive. So I wanted to know what you would recommend as our first step in getting to know the writings of Andrew Piper. Oh, okay. So I would say um, what seems to be sort of a, a general kind of, you know, sort of like, oh, this is what he does would be my novel, The Demonologist. And uh, and then if you're if you're into audio books, uh, my most recent book is an audio only book um, called Oracle on, on Audible, uh, well, Audible and Amazon. And um, it's performed by Joshua Jackson, the actor who does a great job. So if you're, even if you're sort of just an audio book person, I would say that's a good place to start. Outstanding. All right. Well, thank you all for your time. This has been a great event. I've enjoyed listening to every word you've all said. I will hand it over back to our host. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you again to our wonderful panelists. We will be sharing a recording of this webinar with everyone that attended. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, have a great afternoon. And we hope to see you very soon at one of our next events. Take care.